Good morning. <clears throat> what an amazing day. This whole weekend has been amazing to me and an incredible blessing. Uh, it's been such a blessing for me to just reconnect with Matthew and Lorne and Alex and, and, and Kira and their families and uh, Tim and Donna and Curtis and Kimberly and <laughs> Kevin and Jill and so many others, and Brother Edwards, I, I tell you, it's just been a great, great weekend for me, and I'm so thankful to get to be a part of it. During the Bible class, we talked about gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I told you a little bit about some of the survey results that we had as why John was uh, the number one pick. People chose the gospel of John more than the other three that they liked to read the most. And then we talked about Matthew, it came in second, and then I spent most of the class time talking about the Gospel of Luke and some things from the Gospel of Luke for all of us. But I also mentioned I wanted to save the Gospel of Mark for our time this morning during our worship hour. I've been reading the Gospel of Mark over the last six months or so, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight chapters, just kind of depends on my time frame each day, but I... I try to read it, and I just read it over and over and over again, and I want to continue to read the Gospel of Mark. Uh, there's just so many things about it that really fascinate me. Primarily, when you look at the Gospel of Mark, what you're going to find is that it's beautifully divided in half. In the first half of the Gospel of Mark, you have 17 miracles. And in the last half, you only have three, and one of those is the resurrection. But about midway through the 8th chapter, there's this huge shift that takes place in the ministry of Jesus. Because here, he's going to begin telling the apostles, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and I'll be raised on the third day. Ten times he's going to make reference to this, going to Jerusalem, going to suffer, going to die, and so on. So I began wondering, what is it that happens here? What what takes place to cause this massive change in the ministry of Jesus? And if you look at chapter 8, you'll find at the first part of chapter 8, there is the feeding of the 4,000. You have the feeding of the 5,000 back in chapter 6, and then when you get to chapter 8, you have the feeding of the 4,000. Well, after the feeding of the 4,000, you're going to find that Jesus and the apostles get in a boat, and they go over to Dalmanutha, and there they encounter the Pharisees, and the, the Pharisees are are going to have this confrontation with Jesus. They want to see a sign. And Jesus says, you're not going to get a sign. So they leave and they get back in the boat. And as they're traveling across to the Gerizines, what happens is that Jesus tells the apostles to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Now, the apostles don't get it. They're like, is it because we forgot to bring bread? I mean, they can't figure out what on earth Jesus is talking about. And Jesus says, do you not yet see? Do you not yet understand? And it's clear they didn't. And so they get across to this next location. And what happens is they're going to go into the city and they're going to bring a man to Jesus that was blind. And they're going to ask Jesus to touch him. And so Jesus takes him outside the city and he's going to spit on his eyes and he's going to touch him and he's going to ask him, what do you see? And the man's going to say, I, I see people walking around like, like trees. And Jesus is going to touch him again, and then he'll begin to see everything clearly. Now, in my mind, I wanted to know, okay, is it because Jesus couldn't heal him completely the first time? Well, of course not. I mean, we know that Jesus had the power to heal him perfectly the first time, so why? Why do we have this to where he had to touch him twice in order for him to see clearly? And I think it becomes a great illustration of what's taking place with the apostles. Back in the boat, he asked them, Do you not yet see? Do you not yet understand? And immediately following this, what happens as they're walking to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks them, Who do men say that I am? The apostles are like, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And right here, it's at this point, everything changes. Once they acknowledge who Jesus is, that they begin to see him for who he is, 
he changes his ministry. Now he's going to start telling them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, but I'll be raised on the third day. Now, there are a lot of other things about the Gospel of Mark that I find very incredible. For example, the Gospel of Mark begins with Jesus as an adult. You ever thought about that? I mean, when you look at the Gospel of Matthew and you look at the Gospel of Luke, we have the birth narratives of Jesus. And when you look at the Gospel of John, you have the going all the way back to the beginning of creation. But here in Mark, it begins with Jesus as an adult. And what happens here in the very first verse, I mean, the very first verse says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist is going to be identified as the one who is fulfilling the prophecy from Isaiah who said, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. But what I love about this text is it says, the voice of one in the wilderness crying out. The voice of one. In a few verses, we're going to find that Jesus is going to come to John to be baptized by him. And we're going to see in the text that it says, a voice out of the heavens said, and notice the personal way that God says this, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. And then if you read just a few more verses, we're going to see the voice of a man who is possessed with a demon. And notice what he says, what do we have to do with you? We know who you are, the most holy one of God. And then Jesus will cast out the demon. You go on and you read through the Gospel of John, you're going to find uh, another situation to where Jesus is going to take Peter and James and John. They're going to go up to the Mount, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And, of course, Elijah and Moses are going to appear there with Jesus. And, and Peter's like, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And, of course, a cloud descends upon them, and you hear the voice of God again saying to them this is my beloved son listen to him and if you continue to read you're going to find when you get towards the end of the gospel of mark that there is the voice of jesus on the cross crying out my god my god why have you forsaken me and then he's going to give up his last breath and the next voice you hear is a centurion soldier who says truly this man was the Son of God. I just love that. I love the way Mark uses that, that word voice and how it, it plays out throughout the Gospel. And when you read through the Gospel of Mark, you're going to find a lot of key words. There are words like immediately uh, that you're going to find repeated over and over and over, and especially you'll find that in connection to miracles that Jesus will perform. And, you know, it's interesting that when Jesus did a miracle, somebody didn't need physical therapy for six months and then they might not be completely exactly well, but they're going to be a lot better. Not with Jesus. When Jesus healed somebody, it was immediate. I mean, they were mel well uh, completely. And so I, I love that. And, of course, you're going to find key words like faith and disciple and follow and the gospel and preaching and teaching. And then you're going to find this word, amazed. Sometimes it's translated, depending on your translation, as astonished or marveled, I use the American Standard, I like the word amazed. You know, when I think about the word amazed, I think about my grandkids. My grandkids do some pretty amazing things, I'll just tell you. I've got a grandson that can do stuff with a yo-yo that will blow your mind. I watch him and I'm like, dude, that is amazing. And then I've got a granddaughter that taught herself how to play piano. And now she's writing songs. And I'm like, that's pretty amazing to me. And I know that if I went around this room, everybody in this room has either a grandson or a child or a granddaughter or, or a daughter or, I mean, family. We, we know people, and they do amazing things. I mean, this past summer, we watched on television the Olympics. I mean, athletes from all over the world that have amazing talent to do some incredible things. But I think Mark takes this idea of amaze to a level that's far beyond anything like that. And here's why. The book begins and it ends with this idea of being amazed. 
what you find is that Jesus is going to begin teaching as his ministry launches in chapter 1. He's going to heal a demon-possessed man or a man with an unclean spirit. And the text says that the people were amazed. And then when you get to the end of the Gospel of Mark, you're going to find that the women are going to come to the tomb and they're wondering as they get there, who's going to roll away the stone for us? But when they get there, the stone's already rolled away, even though it was large. And when they looked inside, they saw a young man sitting there, an angel. And the text says they were amazed. And the angel says to them, do not be amazed. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's no longer here. Do not be amazed. And I believe that everything in between the first chapter and the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark is to help us see just how amazing our Savior is. Because when you look through this Gospel, what you're going to find is three very incredible things. One, is you're going to find that people were amazed at the teaching of Jesus. Two, they were amazed at the miracles of Jesus. And three, you're going to find just how amazing a person's life is when Jesus touches it. When you look at the first chapter, you're going to find as you get through that chapter, Jesus is going to begin teaching them. And the text says that they were amazed because he taught as one having authority and not as their scribes. And then when you get over to chapter 6, what you're going to find is that Jesus taught with wisdom and they were amazed at the wisdom with which Jesus taught. You get to chapter 10 you're going to find that Jesus begins teaching some very difficult things. Because here you have a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and wants to know what he needs to do to have eternal life. And of course, in the discussion, they're going to talk about the law and they're going to talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, love your neighbors and self. Anyway, the guy's going to say, I've done this from my youth up. And it says that Jesus had a love for him and he says, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell all that you possess, and then come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And you know how the account goes, because he walks away sorrowful, because he was somebody of great wealth. And then Jesus turns to the apostles, and he tells them, it's very difficult for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And they were amazed. And he goes on to say then, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And the text says they were even more amazed and they want to know then who can be saved. And Jesus says with people, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You get to chapter 11, you're going to find that Jesus starts teaching against the religious leaders of the Jews. And the people... Are amazed and then when you get to chapter 12 you're going to find that the religious leaders start trying to trap Jesus so they send this group and they begin testing him and they want to know should we pay tax to Caesar or not now when I think about that now think about that question how it was testing Jesus I want you to think about two of the Apostles that would have been listening and wondering how Jesus was going to respond one of them was Matthew a tax collector now imagine what he would have thought if Jesus said, yes, you should pay tax to, to Caesar. And then think about what Simon the Zealot would have thought. It was almost the perfect trap, except for Jesus. And Jesus says, bring a coin, bring a denarii to me. Whose likeness and inscription is on it? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, well, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and give to God the things that belong to God. And the text says they were amazed. I could go on and on. <laughs> I mean, they were amazed at the teaching of Jesus. But what I wonder is, is that when I read through the Gospels and I read Jesus' teaching, am I amazed at the authority with which Jesus teaches? Am I amazed at the wisdom with which Jesus teaches? And even when he talks about difficult things that are hard for me to understand, or maybe I don't like the way that reads, I mean, do I dig into it because I'm amazed? It's Jesus speaking. Do I dig in and I learn and I want to know more about what he's trying to teach me and how that applies to my life? 
But not only were they amazed at his teaching, they were amazed at his miracles. Now, I'll tell you for me personally, this is a no-brainer. If I were watching somebody like Jesus cast out a demon-possessed man, I'd probably be amazed. And then in chapter 2, he's going, to, he's going to heal a lame man. He's going to cure leprosy. He's going to give sight to the blind. He's going to give somebody who's mute and deaf the ability to hear and speak. I mean, he's going to raise the dead. And when he comes to the apostles, when they're out on a boat, and it's, and it's a storm blowing through here, and Jesus is walking to them on the water. That would be amazing to me. And then when he gets into the boat, everything becomes perfectly calm. And there it tells us that the apostles were amazed. I get it. I would be amazed at seeing something, any of those things, take place. And then I ask myself... <laughs> If even the unclean spirits, if even the demons obeyed the voice of Jesus, then who am I today to think that I don't have to? <laughs> I mean, why on earth would I even consider for a moment that I don't have to do what Jesus teaches me? But the part I love the most is that if Jesus had the power to calm the storm, power over all of nature, if Jesus had the ability to give strength to the lame, sight to the, the blind, to raise the dead, is there anything that he cannot do? I love that. But here's where I really want us to focus. Because when it comes to today, I think where we need to land is thinking about how amazing it is when Jesus comes into our life. If you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 5, if you would. Mark chapter 5, we're going to look <clears throat> briefly at the text here in Mark chapter 5. Basically, just want to tell you kind of the story that's going on here. You can kind of follow along in the text. Jesus and the apostles, of course, are coming across. They're in a boat, and they get to the country of the Gerasenes. When they get there and they get out of the boat, immediately there is a man that comes up to them with an unclean spirit. And when this man with the unclean spirit comes up to them, the text gives us a little history as to what's going on with this individual. Because it tells us here in the text that <clears throat> nobody was able to bind him. They had tried to, they had bound him with shackles and with chains, and he broke the, sh the, char the shackles apart and the chains he busted apart. And it tells us that no one was strong enough to subdue him anymore. So he lived among the tombs and in the mountains. And the text says that night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Now, I cannot personally even fathom. I can't imagine what his life was like. I, I, I do get a little concerned when we try to compare sin today to being demon-possessed because I don't think that's accurate. This man had something going on in him I don't think we can even comprehend. Night and day he was screaming in the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus, he runs up to him and the text says that he worshipped him. Now, your translation may say he bowed down to him. But that's our word, worship. He worshiped him. What do we have to do with you? I know who you are. He acknowledged Jesus as the Son of the Most High God. And, of course, Jesus asks, what is your name? He says, her name is Legion, for we are many. Can you imagine? Many demons and they begged Jesus not to cast them out of the country but instead there was a herd of pigs 2,000 pigs over here on the side of the mountain that they asked Jesus to let them go into the pigs and so he allowed it and they went into the pigs and they rushed down the steep bank into the sea and they were drowned now I want you to think for just a moment if you were the herdsman for these pigs what you might be thinking. 
text tells us that they ran to the city and into the villages and they began telling everybody about what they had just seen. I probably would too. <laughs> and so what happens is the people now come out. And they want to investigate and see. And when they get there, they see Jesus and this man who had been demon-possessed clothed and sitting in his right mind. And then the herdsmen begin to tell them everything that took place. And this is the part I don't understand. They begged Jesus to leave. The people begged Jesus to leave them. And I'm like, what? I'd be like, hey, can you stick around? I'd like to know a little bit more about what you got to do. And so Jesus and the apostles get in the boat, and they're about to leave. And the man who was possessed with this legion of demons comes up to Jesus, and he begs him to go with him. Now I tell you, I think I would probably do the same thing. Wouldn't you? I mean, if you had been this individual, had this demon possession, multiple demons inside of you, wouldn't you also want to go with Jesus if he healed you? I mean, here... You, you hadn't been a part of society and for a long time he lived among the tombs screaming night and day and here you've got a guy that comes along and he casts these demons out. It's probably the most peaceful moment he had had in decades of time. He wants to go with Jesus and Jesus says no. He says, I want you to go to your people. Some translations say, I want you to go to your friends. I want you to go to your people, your family. You tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how that He's shown mercy to you. And in verse 20 of that text, it tells us that's what He did. He went to the region of the Decapolis, and He began to proclaim or to preach to them, saying about great things Jesus had done for Him. And I want you to notice the very last phrase in that verse. And they were amazed. Everyone was amazed. Every time I read this text, I have so many thoughts and so many questions. And when I share this lesson with folks, I just, I just ask, when you think about the people in your sphere of influence, your friends, your family, is everyone amazed? Is anyone amazed? When people who know you think about who you were before you became a Christian and who you know are now as a Christian, are they amazed? If not, then maybe what we need to start doing is exactly what this man did. We need to start telling others about the great things that God is doing in our life and how that He's shown mercy upon us. I mean, God is doing some great things in our life, isn't He? He has shown us mercy, hasn't He? You know, there's only one time in the Gospel of Mark where this word amazed is used in connection to Jesus. In chapter 6, it tells us that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. He had gone to his own hometown and they couldn't figure it out. They were like, this is the carpenter. His mother Mary is here. His brothers and his his sisters, and they took offense at him. And he was able to do no miracles there except he healed a few, few sick people. But then he says, the text says, that he was amazed at their unbelief. When I think about my relationship with God, I know there are times in my life, and maybe you've experienced times in your life, to where you begin to doubt or to wonder or maybe your faith is not what it should be. And I have to ask myself, would Jesus be amazed in those times at my unbelief? You know, I keep coming back to where we began. 
in this book. And that is the voice of John the Baptist. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight His path. And I think about this demon-possessed man who became the voice of one who went to his people, his friends, his family, and he began telling them about the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. I'm I'm not even going to come close to being able to reach all the people that you know. I will probably never meet the people you know. But I do know this, that you can become the voice of one in your family and among your friends to point people to Jesus, to tell them about the great things that Jesus has done in your life. And how that he has shown mercy to you. And I can do the same in my family, in my sphere of influence, in my friends. We can be the voice of one. Now, it is also interesting to me that this book begins and it ends in talking about the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist pointed people to that good news. Jesus, the text tells us, proclaimed that good news, and the apostles were commissioned to go and preach that good news to all of creation. And I'm thankful in my life that somewhere along the way, God made it possible for me to hear that good news. The good news that Jesus truly is the Son of God. That He came to this earth and that He went to Jerusalem, He suffered and He died, and He was raised on the third day. And I am thankful, not only for having believed that message, but having been baptized to know that my sins were washed away so that I could be raised to walk in a new life. And to me, that's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that God would come and in my life take the things of my past and never hold those against me again because they were washed away in the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross. To me, that's pretty amazing. And it's even more amazing that even though I walk through this life, there are many times I struggle and I fall so short of who I need to be, but I'm thankful that that blood continues to cleanse me. It's always hard when you're visiting a congregation and you don't know. You don't know people. You don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what, what people have experienced in their life. But maybe, maybe in your life, you haven't obeyed that gospel message, that good news. Maybe you haven't turned from that past life and that you've decided that you want to follow Jesus. Maybe you want this amazing Savior to be a part of your life and to do the same thing that He's done for so many. And I know that there is water here that's ready and you could be baptized today as others have in the last few weeks and that your sins can be washed away. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? And you could be raised to walk in a new life. And God would no longer hold those things of anything in your past against you. I think for most of us, we've we've done that. And so the thing that we have to do is we have to continue to think, okay, am I... Am I living the kind of life that the people who knew me before and know me now, that they would, they're amazed that I'm so different because of this new life that I'm now living? I'm not living like I used to. I'm living a new life. 
would they be amazed? I hope that as we sing this song here in just a second, that as you think about your life, if you want to see how amazing your life can be when Jesus comes into it, I hope that you'll make that decision today. And if we can help you in that decision, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.